In November 2014, the MacArthur Memorial hosted a World War I Centennial Symposium in partnership with the Hampton Roads Naval Museum and the Old Dominion University Department of History. The following is a lecture by one of the symposium presenters, Dr. Lee Craig. Dr. Craig is the author of Josephus Daniels, the story of the Secretary of the Navy who helped prepare the United States Navy for eventual involvement in World War I. My talk today is about uh, Josephus Daniels and his role as uh, uh, Secretary of the Navy during the First World War. And uh, while you were enjoying lunch, I was being uh, uh, interviewed uh, on C-SPAN. And uh, the first question that I got was, why would Josephus Daniels, a small town newspaper editor, be uh, Secretary of the Navy during the First World War? And the short answer to that is politics. Uh, the longer answer is Daniels was a, um, a, a very important player in the Democratic Party at both the national and the, the state and regional level. Uh, he had been a member of the Democratic National Committee for 20 years by the time the, uh, the 1912 presidential election rolled around. And he was a newspaper publisher and, and arguably one of the most uh, uh, important voices uh, democratic voices in the South. That's what put him on Wilson's radar screen initially. And then he played an important role in getting Wilson nominated, and then he played an important role in getting Wilson elected. And so Wilson came to appreciate Daniels for his political uh, wisdom, his connections, and power. And so he wanted Daniels to be in the cabinet as a, um, as a political advisor. And you say, well, okay, you've persuaded us why he would want Daniels in the cabinet, but why, why the Navy? I mean, why not? There wasn't going to be a big war in the spring of 1913, right? So who cared who ran the Army or the Navy from Wilson's perspective? He just wanted uh, politically connected and wise advisors. Well, turns out Daniels had no military background whatsoever. As near as I can tell, the only time he was ever on a naval vessel in his life was when he took a ferry to the Outer Banks of North Carolina for vacation. Uh, so he had no military background or preparation for this job. Uh, he was, however, he wasn't just a political hack. He was a successful businessman, was a self-made man, and had made a fortune. And that's really how I came to study Daniels, uh, was from his success as a, as a uh, publisher and a capitalist rather than as a, a, a military leader. That's why a, an economic historian wrote his biography rather than a, a, a military historian. But I thought I would organize the, uh, the talk uh, about his time in Wilson's administration and during the war, specifically, uh, into three parts. We'll talk about before the war, leading up to the war as one part, and then the war itself, and then the immediate aftermath. With respect to what was going on in the, uh, in the Navy before the war, I think one of the most important aspects of his management was integrating the, the new military technologies of the big battleship and uh, the dreadnoughts, as they were referred to at the time, and the submarine, uh, the U-boats, into the Navy. And the, the martial side of that, strategic side of that, he left to his admirals. But there was a managerial and an organizational side that he was, he was responsible for, at least partly. And one of the most important things he did was he got Congress, he was the administration's uh, point person on getting Congress to pay for those, uh, those new technologies. Um, in today's dollars, a single dreadnought would run into the, uh, the billions of dollars. And the Navy was a substantial proportion of the overall federal budget at that time, much larger than it is today. And the battleships were a substantial proportion of, uh, of the Navy's budget. And so just getting the funding lined up, the naval spending and building program, uh, was an important task. 
Um, also, he faced some organizational and managerial issues. With respect to the organization of the Navy, when Daniels took over in the spring of 1913, the organizational chart, to put it in, in business terms, had not really been changed since before the Civil War. And with the electronic communications, Daniels wanted to see the, the organizational chart move from a, what you might think of as a flat chart to a, a horizontal chart to a more vertical uh, chart where command and control could move up and down the line more directly with the, the communication technologies that had been improved since before the Civil War. But he also had some managerial issues with his admirals. That was partly related to Daniel's vision of the Navy. And Daniels was about as close to a pacifist as uh, the leader of a military organization could be. And so he, unlike his admirals, who saw the Navy fairly clearly in martial terms, Daniels saw the Navy as a big vocational school. He thought it was a place where young men could enter and learn a trade and then leave with a, a skill for the private sector. In addition, he focused heavily on the moral improvement of the young men who entered the Navy. Specifically, he thought that they should come into the Navy and leave the Navy without ever having consumed alcohol and also without ever visiting a house of prostitution in a Navy port. And so he spent a good bit of time uh, and effort cleaning up the red light districts around the ports. And he also banned alcohol from the ships and, uh, and bases. It's from that that we, we get the expression cup of Joe because when he banned alcohol, there was an increase in the, the coffee rations and the, the sailors would angrily uh, refer to it as a cup of Josephus Daniels. Uh, and it was eventually shortened to um, cup of Joe. And so he had these conflicts with the leadership of the Navy, and uh, those ran more or less throughout his, his tenure as, uh, as secretary. Uh, once war came, uh, initially, of course, uh, when, when war begins in Europe, the U United States is, is not a, a combatant. But Daniels, uh, who as a newspaper publisher had been very critical of the Republican administrations that had preceded Wilson's administration. In particular, he had been critical of uh, gunboat diplomacy and uh, U.S. imperialism more generally. He actually becomes a uh, aggressive, albeit reluctant, uh, gunboat diplomatist. So he either oversees or directly orders invasions and occupations of uh, Nicaragua, Cuba, Mexico, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. With respect to the invasion of Mexico, that's a direct uh, response to uh, the Germans were uh, running guns to uh, one side during the Mexican Revolution. And enforcing the Monroe Doctrine becomes an important part of Navy policy. And so, of course, the U U.S. Uh, invades. And then later, with respect to Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the reason that was given for invading those countries, or at least the reasons the Navy Department gave for invading those countries was to keep uh, German influence and U-boat pens from uh, being established in those countries. Daniels was referred to, again, not favorably by the end of his administration as King Josephus I, ruler of Haiti, and uh, or the uh, sometimes he's referred to as the King of the Dominican Republic because it's basically the Navy and the Marine Corps that are running those countries during Daniel's administration. So he gets involved, again, rather reluctantly in um, these gunboat excursions in, the, um, in the Caribbean and, and, and Central America. Another aspect of the administration's policies with respect to the war before the United States uh, enters the war is the uh, formal policy of the administration, which is neutrality. And Daniels was a staunch supporter of the administration's neutrality policy as it was announced. But he and Wilson had a great deal of conflict over how the policy was actually carried out. Wilson, in Daniel's view, favored the British. Arguably, that may have been the more popular political position in the country. 
that was not Daniel's position. He never made a moral distinction between the British and the French on the one hand and the Germans on the other. With respect to the violations of international law, which so outraged the other members of the administration and the public, particularly I'm referring here to the waging of the U-boat war by the Germans in the Atlantic, Daniels thought that the British, with their blockading policy and mine-laying policies in the North Sea and their stopping of uh, neutral vessels and uh, interning them, he thought those violations were just as egregious as the Germans' violations of international law while they were waging the U-boat war. So his policy, his, his personal views, were of a much more stricter neutrality than what he felt uh, the administration was engaged in in practice. And so this, as, as I mentioned, this led to a, a bit of a rupture in his relationship with Wilson. Well, eventually, of course, the country goes to, to war with Germany, and then all of his reservations about violations of international law go out the window, and he starts engaging in all of the practices that he had criticized the British for before the U.S. joined the team, so to speak, the most prominent of which was setting up a minefield between uh, Scotland and Norway, basically sealing off the North Sea so the German U-boats could not escape out in, into the Atlantic. So when the country, the United States, enters the war then in 1917, Daniels is uh, basically confronted with two major problems. One of those is the U-boats in the Atlantic, and the other is transporting the army to battlefields in France. And so with respect to combating the U-boats, the British were, of course, blockading the continent and stopping just about anything from getting in or out. And then the Germans were in turn trying to get the British and the French publics to put pressure on their governments to sue for peace by cutting off their aid from the rest of the world, particularly the United States, with the, the U-boats in the Atlantic. And so these problems of addressing the U-boat menace and getting food and supplies to the British and the French and getting troops to the front, they're two sides of the same coin. It's basically controlling the sea lanes uh, in the Atlantic. And so the primary manner in which Daniels has the Navy do this is through the convoy system. Previously, the British had favored sending lone ships out. And their argument was when you put ships in a convoy, what you do is, first of all, you make a larger target. And second of all, the convoy can only move as fast as its slowest member. So essentially, if you, if you use the metaphor of predators on the plains of Africa, you're just creating large, slow creatures to be eaten. I think what was underestimated there was the ability of the U.S. economy to generate escort vessels and to just the sheer number of ships that the U.S. could bring very quickly to the equation to get the convoys uh, safely across the Atlantic. And the same with the troop transports. After the war, Daniels is asked what he thought the Navy's largest contribution to the war was and uh, he said it was transporting the army into the field to, uh, to defeat the German in France. And Daniels was the last member of Wilson's administration to, of the cabinet to vote for war in the spring of, of 1917. One of the reasons why he waited so long before he would finally vote for war was because he felt it would take an enormous army and casualties as a result of that uh, to defeat the Germans in the field. And most of the other cabinet members did not agree with this. They thought that the United States would just supply material aid and in the U-boat menace, and that would be enough. But Daniel said, no, we're, we're going to need an army. And so he thought the, the most important thing that the Navy did was to get that army into the field. And he claimed, now I, in my research, I was not able to verify this, but he claimed that no U.S. serviceman or woman 
lost their life on a U.S. Navy vessel while being transported to France. And if that's true, that would be a tremendous uh, accomplishment. In any case, uh, he did get the Army over there, and war was, uh, was uh, eventually uh, brought to a, a conclusion. And that set up the uh, post-war settlements. Daniels played an important role in the post-war settlement in two respects. He joined Wilson in the late winter and early spring of 1919 while the peace treaties that were uh, being uh, designed to uh, wrap up the war. So Wilson used Daniels as a, a kind of a roving advisor. As such, he sent him to the various places in Europe where the boundaries of the new nation states were going to be carved. Two of these happened to be Italy and Germany. And the issues involved were the boundary settlements between uh, the Italians and the new uh, Yugoslav uh, Republic on the one hand. And then the other issue was between Germany and Poland and the, the so-called Danzig Corridor on, on the other hand. And so Wilson sends Daniels out, and Daniels comes back, and he gives his report. And uh, his report is, if you go with the British and the French, who were advising uh, a more generous settlement for the Yugoslavs relative to the Italians, and who were advising a more generous settlement for the Poles relative to the Germans, if you listen to this advice, you're going to have trouble in the future. Wilson did not listen to that advice. It's not clear that uh, if he had listened that he could have done anything differently or that that would have prevented the rise of fascism in Italy and, and Germany. But certainly the way that the two boundaries were ultimately settled did not contribute to the establishment and uh, maintenance of peace after the war. Now, the story that we're told is that as you know, Wilson made territorial concessions uh, to the extent that he cared about these issues in order to secure the inclusion in the treaty, the first of the, the major treaties, the Versailles Treaty, of the League of Nations. And initially, Daniels was on board with supporting the League of Nations. And in particular, the expression that uh, surrounded the discussion of the League was uh, collective security, that the problems that led to the First World War were these uh, one-off treaties between countries that then came into conflict. And what we really needed was collective security, and the League would guarantee that. Well, as I said, initially Daniels was supportive of that view because he was persuaded that that would have kept the Germans, uh, in particular, from, from being so aggressive. And he thought that if there was a league, in fact, he thought the league would be necessary if the territorial settlements that were on the table, uh, again, just for example, the ones that he was involved in, um, uh, Italy and, uh, and Germany, if those, the proposed territorial settlements were, in fact, the ones that came about after the war, after the, uh, uh, the treaties were signed, which they did, that there would be trouble with the Italians and the Germans, which there was, and that we would need the joint military forces, again, the expression collective security, of the League in order to keep the Germans and the Italians in their respective places. Now, in a relatively short period of time, his view of this changes almost 180 degrees. Even though he continues to voice in public support for Wilson and the League, he begins to have reservations in private. And in particular, these reservations come from the second issue. Uh, I, I mentioned there were two. One was the uh, territorial settlements that he was advising Wilson on in, at the peace conferences in the spring of 1919. The other was the post-war naval arrangements. And so it's part of the post-war naval arrangements 
that Daniels is a, a party to that leads him to begin to question Wilson's strategy with respect to uh, the future of, of the, the League of Nations and the, the series of treaties that ultimately uh, wrap up the war. And he gets involved with negotiating with the British over the relative uh, uh, naval power after the war. The problem is that a lot of the leaders saw the naval arms race between the Germans and the British as a key component leading to the onset of the, the war. And so, you know, there are political voices that are saying, how can we avoid a repeat of this problem? And Daniels, who, when he first took over the Navy in the spring of 1913, basically saw it as a big trade school for its enlisted men and a place of moral uplift where young men could go and hide from the temptations of alcohol and wayward women for a few years during late adolescence and early adulthood. After entering the administration with that view, after fighting the war, he realizes that he had exactly the wrong view, that watching during the early years of the war, watching the British drive the Germans, after the Germans had put all of this money, all of this treasure and these public resources into building the second largest navy in the world, the second most powerful navy in the world, he realized having the second most powerful navy in the world doesn't do you much good if you go to war with the country that has the most powerful navy in the world. And so he, he, he really flips almost 180 degrees in his view of the Navy, and he realizes what the United States needs is not a good trade school, but what it needs is the world's largest, most power, unambiguously, the world's largest, most powerful Navy. Although the U.S. had had ships in the Pacific before, this is where the expression, the two ocean Navy, uh, comes from. So you need a Navy building program that will basically give you the largest Navy in the world split between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Partly this stems from what I was talking about earlier with respect to his views of the Germans and the British. The Germans always thought the American administration and the American public were pro-British, and arguably they were. But again, Daniels was not. He was uh, as ready to prepare for the next war against the British as he was to prepare for the next war against the Germans or uh, the Japanese or whomever that might be. So after he advises Wilson on the Danzig and Polish question and after he advises Wilson on the Yugoslav-Italian question, which Wilson does not take his advice, Daniels is off to, to London to negotiate with the British. Now, you may say, well, what was there to negotiate? Well, again, the political leadership of powers that had engaged in, in war had come to the conclusion that, you know what, we spent a lot of money in our naval arms races, and we got a lot of people killed, and maybe as part of these post-war discussions, treaties, settlement, and so forth, maybe we could come up with a better way of organizing uh, our international military relations so that, if nothing else, at least it might be a little cheaper. It might save us a little money. So they're talking about the, the post-war naval arms settlement relationship, which basically meant reduction. So the British Empire had financially been driven to the brink by the war. So financing the perpetuation of the world's largest navy was going to be a cost that the British politicians were going to have a difficult time selling to the British taxpayers. Daniels recognizes this. He does a tour of all the uh, political people uh, who he's supposed to see. In, uh, in England, spends some time with the king, and ends up in Parliament in a late-night meeting with the Secretary of State for War at that time, 
the equivalent, I guess, of our defense minister, to our, our secretary of defense today, Winston Churchill. And in the book, I describe the scene as Churchill and Daniels discussing the post-war naval treaty over brandy and cigars, all of which were consumed by Churchill, since Daniels neither drank nor smoked. Their relationship was not a warm one, and it was not one that they perpetuated. Churchill told Daniels that the British had to maintain, because of the, the nature of its empire, the British had to maintain the largest navy in the world. And Daniels told Churchill that because of what he had learned, he, Daniels, had learned during the First World War that the United States had to have the world's largest, most powerful navy. Churchill said, well, okay. I'm putting this in my own words. I'm not as eloquent as Churchill, so uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing for you here. Churchill says, okay, go ahead. And Daniel says, well, okay, we will, uh, suspecting uh, rightly that the British will not be able to continue to fund a naval building program at the same rate that the, the United States could fund a building program. One of the reasons being uh, because the British gold reserves were now resting in the United States because basically the British had been paying the United States to help keep them in the war before the United States entered the war. And so Daniels and Churchill have this, this long back and forth and they walk away with no agreement. So Daniels goes back to Paris, tells um, Wilson, you know, we, we tried to settle this, we couldn't, and we just need to stick with our naval building program, which in a few years, assuming the British did not up their naval building program, which Daniels did not think that they could do politically or financially, would ultimately give the United States its two ocean navy and uh, the largest navy in the world. So he goes back to the United States. This is uh, 1919. And it turns out that the Republicans had taken control of the Congress in the, in the, the midterm elections. And by the time he, he had tried before he went to France in uh, late winter, early spring of 1919, he had tried to get the lame duck session of Congress, which was still controlled by the, the Democrats, to fund the next installment of the building program. They had uh, dragged their feet. The war was ending. And they didn't want to, uh, to commit to the amount of money that Daniels was asking for. And so the issue is rolled over into the next Congress. And uh, the Republicans, uh, after these, this torturous set of negotiations in uh, Paris and London, the Congress will not fund the naval building program. And so it becomes uh, eventually the Harding administration's problem to address following the 1920 election. Another question that I received uh, related to the 1920 election in the, the earlier uh, interview that I, I did on, on C-SPAN, the question came up of what role did Franklin Delano Roosevelt play in Daniel's tenure as uh, Secretary of the Navy? I'll start at the end of that and work backwards. The end came before the 1920 election because FDR was the Democratic Party's nominee for vice president. And so in order to campaign, he leaves the administration. Franklin Roosevelt had initially been brought into the administration by Josephus Daniels. And Daniels had named FDR as his assistant secretary. I don't know how many assistant and undersecretaries there are today uh, of cabinet positions, but all I know is what I read in the newspaper and see on C-SPAN. My understanding is that there are a lot. That's a fairly large number. Uh, in those days, you got one. And so Daniels, after the election, the initial Wilson election in the fall of 1912, he thinks, oh, wouldn't it be a nice political, a nice public relations coup if we could bring into only the uh, second democratic administration uh, since before the Civil War, remember the others were Grover Cleveland. Those of you who are old enough, and I won't make eye contact with any of you, but uh, you remember we used to have to memorize the presidents. And remember all the ones 
after the Civil War. They all had the same beard and looked alike. The one in that group who was different, the outlier, was Grover Cleveland. So he had two non-consecutive terms as president, and he was the only Democrat between Buchanan, before Lincoln, and Wilson, which was one of the reasons why Daniels was so supportive of uh, politician uh, Wilson was because he was a winner. And after losing three times with Bryan, who was a close friend of Daniels and colleague, he thought that, uh, that Wilson was, uh, was the way to go. Well, one of those Republicans was uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt uh, may or may not have been a good president, depending on your perspective, but he was a very bad ex-president. And he just was not constitutionally suited to be an ex-president. And so he had run as a, being rejected by the, the elders of the uh, Republican Party as a candidate against Wilson in 1912. He ran as a um, independent bull moose uh, candidate. So Daniels thought that it would really make the administration look good from the beginning to bring a Roosevelt into a Democratic administration. And so in his correspondence, he was describing later, actually, in his correspondence later in life, he described how he had this vision of this young man that he knew so well and that he had identified as having, quote, the right stuff to bring him into the administration as his assistant secretary. But in going over Daniel's primary sources, uh, his diary and a uh, a letter uh, to his wife. He said uh, to his wife, I shall bring Frederick D. Roosevelt into my department as assistant secretary. So it's possible that he did not know uh, Frederick Roosevelt uh, as well as he claimed years later that he did at the time. So he brought Roosevelt into the administration. They served very closely together throughout Wilson's two administrations until FDR left the Navy Department uh, right at the end of the second uh, administration, as it turns out, when things went really badly after the Republicans take power in the Congress in 1918, and then um, the League of Nations uh, runs into a lot of trouble. And with respect to the Navy, when the Republicans get control, they conduct some investigations into the waging of the war and the Navy is uh, subjective to um, some very distasteful investigation of its, uh, the Marines' behavior in uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and uh, also Daniel's management with respect to planning for the war and, and, and so forth. And so FDR, uh, like a lot of very successful politicians, knows uh, when to leave a, a, a troubled ship and so he went his own way politically, and Daniels went his way. If you saw the, uh, the Ken Burns' recent documentary uh, series about the Roosevelt, Daniels was not presented very favorably in the episode on the First World War, and his troubled relationship with FDR was highlighted. And they did have one side of their relationship was troubled. There was a, a lot of cultural difference between the two, and FDR was not a particularly loyal uh, assistant secretary, and he was one of the more bellicose voices in the administration advocating a, a more aggressive position toward the Germans. But that was only one side of their relationship. Later in life, FDR would often uh, introduce Daniels who ultimately be became FDR's ambassador to Mexico during the 1930s and the, the, the Second World War. That was only one side of their relationship. Later on, when FDR would introduce Daniels to his friends and, and political colleagues, he would introduce him as the man who taught him a lot that he needed to know, that was FDR's expression, about politics, and he recognized that Daniels had been a pretty good political mentor for him in Washington. And so wrapping up the Wilson administration with FDR's entry into the, uh, as a vice presidential candidate into the 1920 campaign would be a good place for me to stop, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening.
If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.